continue our worship with our um, call to worship song, Come Let Us Worship the Lord. Shall we stand? Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We thank you, dear Lord, for your speedy work on the sanctuary, a job that normally should have took almost a year, and it's done in just a few months. Thank you for the help of everyone here and all the good prayers and just the way you watch over this little church, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to watch over each and every one of us here and those who are attending on the web and those who couldn't make it today. Please watch over all of us, Lord. You know our pains and our weaknesses and our trials and our struggles. Lord, there's no way we could make it through this world if it wasn't for you, and we know that. And we ask for your help, your love, your kindness, your patience. And dear Lord, please give us all a special blessing according to your will. We pray this now in your loving Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing for our hymn of praise, number 517, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Number 517. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
and it's time for the uh, children's story by Stan Arnaud. And first we'll do the offering for the Needles uh, Church School. Good morning, kids. I'd like to uh, first offer a sequel to the last story I told about William Miller. His, uh, his 4,500 man army defeating 15,000 British. Uh, I neglected to mention last time that those 15,000 had just returned from victory over Napoleon in Europe, the Battle of Waterloo. <clears throat> and William Miller's army defeated them. <clears throat> uh, I want to pick up with another pioneer story a little more recent, uh, the uh, establishment of Loma Linda. Loma Linda was originally called Mound City, and its uh, Mound City Hotel was a tourist center where it was built on the hill and it went under in 1888 and uh, another group of doctors bought the property and uh, tried to turn it into a health center and it went under and they called it Lonesome Linda, they changed the name to Loma Linda. <coughs> Uh, and it was first uh, listed at 110000 And back in those days, uh, you could hire a good carpenter for a dollar a day. So that was a, a huge amount of money. <clears throat> and uh, Elder Burden... Uh, was acquainted with the property. I remember when I was a boy in Loma Linda, we used to go to a place called Burden Hall to watch nature uh, movies, videos, <clears throat> and uh, I never realized who he was. But uh, they offered it, they reduced the price down to 85000 which was way beyond reason. And then uh, they put it down to 45,000. And then uh, Elder Burden went to see them and uh, they put it all the way down to 40,000. So the, the Adventist church in this area was very small at that time. They had already uh, worked on establishing two sanitariums and they were burdened. <clears throat> the conference uh, couldn't uh, put any money toward it. And finally, uh, uh, Ellen, Ellen White uh, sent a letter to Elder Burden and did something out of character for her. And she used, she would uh, consult with the brethren, but she knew that this was a good place to get. And so she said, uh, just get it. And uh, to make a long story short, <clears throat> um, Elder Burden put up a thousand dollars of his own money, signed the contract in his own name, to secure the property. And he had a lot of cliff hangers to deal with. <clears throat> but uh, one of the things that built his faith was that uh, there was a man south of LA that had mentioned to uh, certain brother Owen that when he sold some property, he would uh, make it available for uh, charitable purposes. So Elder Burden and this man went down to see him on the railroad, 
car and uh, arrived at his home, walked from the railroad station to his home, and there was nobody there. So they went back to uh, railroad station, and they missed the train. And so they had to wait for two hours, and finally they decided, well, let's go back again. And it was the evening, and the uh, man was there eating his supper, and this was, was a perfect stranger. So Elder Burden went up to him and, uh, and said, do you know Ellen White? And immediately he brightened up and uh, said yes. And so they visited a while and uh, Elder Burden was straightforward with him, told him what uh, he needed. And the farmer said, praise the Lord. Put down his fork and knife and uh, uh, <clears throat> he said, why, I have been praying for months that the Lord would send us a buyer. And they had recently sold out and they had the money in the bank. So they pulled out a bank deposit <clears throat> for $2,400 and signed it over to Elder Burden, a stranger up to that point. And... Uh, there was no receipt form there, and the benefactor said, well, it's none called for. He said, the Lord is in this. It's all right. So that encouraged Elder Burden's faith for the trials, plenty of them yet to come. And so they had to uh, finish coming up with the first $5,000, and uh, Elder Burden put up his thousand, and <clears throat> there was another 5,000 due at a certain date, and they were doing it in 5,000 increments, and then they were going to do the last 20,000 later, but uh, there was quite a bit of difficulty because there were certain the Pacific Union wasn't uh, approving of it. And, uh, they went forward in faith and it came to uh, another $5,000 payment. I'm really trying to condense a lot here. Uh, they had to make this payment on a certain date. So this is, they had a meeting, and uh, it was an upstairs room, suspense reigning. When the committee went out into session that morning, the leading officers recommended that they acknowledge their inability, they only had a little bit of money in their account, their inability to follow through and lose the $5,000 already paid if necessary and be freed from further obligation. Those who were so far had so far borne the, bur borne the burden of the purchase firmly resisted the suggestion. When pressed by the committee to offer a solution, they could only answer in faith that somehow the Lord would bring relief and suggested that possibly the morning mail would bring the answer. Just then, they heard the mailman's tread as he ascended the stairs to their second floor office. The room was quiet. Nearly everyone choked with hope and anxiety as the carrier took the last few steps. He delivered a letter postmarked Atlantic City, New Jersey. Who could have sent it? No one knew until it was opened and enclosed a draft for $5,000. <clears> As each looked at each other, all eyes flooded with tears. Deeply moved, the chief opponent broke the silence. It seems that the Lord is in this thing, he said. There was a quick answer, of course he is. He's going to carry it through. The donor had been told of the need by Ellen White. 
John Burden and his associates began canvassing the Churches of Southern California Conference in anticipation of a third $5,000 payment. They obtained nothing, but time still remained. Then a letter came from a member of the Oregon, in Oregon, who had heard of the purchase. He asked if any money was needed and received a prompt reply. His check for $4,500 arrived in time. To it, they added the 400 left over from the original gift. Then a woman, encouraged by the acts of faith by others, gave the last $100 needed for the payment. Soon, sufficient money came in to make the fourth payment before it was due. In recognition of this courtesy, the sellers reduced the balance by $100. About this time, the sellers discovered that they could not distribute to their stockholders the 20000 paid till their corporation was ready to be dissolved. Dissolution could not be legally effected until they had received the payment of the three-year note. Anxious for their money, the stockholders authorized a discount of $1,000 on the balance of 20000 The new owners began a search for 18900 Meanwhile, Loma Linda Sanitarium received its first guest. The institution was not quite prepared for guests, but this one was made comfortable. On her second day, she wandered through the beautiful grounds. Recently widowed, she felt sad and tearful. I get so lonesome. She confided in Elder Burden that sometimes I wish I were dead. She thought she would, could be happy living in such a place. So, someone suggested a life annuity. She was ushered into the business office, and when a cash payment of $7,000 was quoted, she brightened and said, why, I have that much in cash. Both parties signed the contract. She paid 6200 by December 18 and promised the balance by February 1. She became a guest of the institution, but was not thought of as a patient. An elderly brother in the church arranged for a similar annuity of 3,500. When a former Glendale patient learned of the discount offered for a final settlement, she offered to lend 15,000 for two or three years. Thus, within seven months, a total of 38,900, some as gifts, some as loans, had come in. The payment was made in full. And that's not the only story of miracles in Loma Linda, but it's probably enough for today. Thank you, Stan, for the little history lesson on Loma Linda. Now it's time for our offering. Today's offering is for Radio Ministries. And if you'd like your offering to go that, mark your envelopes as such, and... Our ushers will stand now and collect offering. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful love, for your glory, for your grace, for your wisdom, and your patience. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to give a little bit back to you. And we ask you, dear Lord, to please continue to show your graces on us as you always have. We pray this now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
Let's prepare our hearts for prayer by singing as we come to you in prayer. who are inclined, please kneel. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your presence in our lives. And dear Lord, we thank you for letting us know that you hear our prayers this morning as we went through our joys and concerns. We heard the blessings that you sent to those who we prayed for. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the way you always watch over us and the way that you're always there for us. We thank you, dear, dear Lord, for your son, Jesus, who came to this world so that we could have eternal life. Dear Heavenly Father, your blessings know no limits. And we ask you, dear Lord, to please continue to bless us and bless this church Hear our prayers and speed them to those in need. We pray this now in your loving Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline thine ear to is found in the book of Hebrews. It'll come from Hebrews 11, and it'll be one through three. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good testimony. By faith we understand that the words are framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Amen. Good morning, church family. It is a beautiful day in Yucca Valley. There's something about driving up here from the lower desert. and You come up this hill and all you see is sort of like dry hills and Joshua trees, which are beautiful. And you just come over the crest, you look into this valley, and it's beautiful, it's such a beautiful, restful place. I'm, I'm glad to be able to come here on this beautiful Sabbath day and, and just worship together. Thank you, Stan, for sharing that story, because um, as you told that story, I, I started recounting in my own mind many stories that I've heard passed down <clears throat> through our family about the... Uh, the early years of Loma Linda, I had great uncles and aunts who were heads of uh, departments, nursing department, physical therapy department. My grandfather helped um, build the parts of the hospital, maintain it. I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> but his house is still on Prospect Street. He built that way back in 19, early 1900s. So God... God is good and God is, is so merciful and so gracious. And it takes faith for us to step out. And Ellen White and Burden and Elder Burden and Loughborough and the list goes on and on. Haskell. Um, these were men and women of, of great faith. And they knew that if they would just step out 
in faith and believe that God is faithful, that God would reward that faith, and he certainly did, even, even now. Those of you that have kept uh, an ear to what was going on there a number of years ago that the building stopped, built, they stopped building because there was no funds to finish the building. I don't know if how many of you know that, but um, I know some of the people that are doing, you know, on the building crews, and they said, no funds. So they didn't know what to do, and they went to their knees, and they began to make phone calls, and uh, they got some big donations. You can see it on the side of the building who donated, um, some large donations, and they were able to finish the hospital. It is by far one of the most beautiful hospitals I have seen, and I've seen a lot of hospitals. But folks, if it were not for the faith and the faithfulness of God's people, that hospital wouldn't be there today, helping the community, um, being on the cutting edge of medicine, bringing healing to those who need healing. And just, it, it's a presence. I wish they would call the hospital Faith Hospital. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? Because that is the history of Loma Linda Hospital. It is by faith that that building uh, exists and continue to pray for them. You know, it's not easy to keep a big facility like that open and to keep it staffed. Um, these are not easy times to be staffing hospitals. A lot of nurses, um, they go other places. Sometimes the pay is better in other hospitals, but the nurses at Loma Linda are very dedicated, very loving, very kind people, and I've met many of them. So continue to pray for them. Um, thanks, Stan, for that story. kind of revives the, 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 the faith in all of us and uh, gives us sort of a, a little picture of how God has worked in the past. That's the beautiful thing about the Bible is as we read the Bible, we discover that it really, it's a story, it's a story of the interaction between God and his people. Right from the very beginning, the Genesis, God created man, and then God had a plan for their salvation when they, when they broke uh, that beautiful um, vessel, the beautiful garden. And then God had a plan to save to bring them salvation. And that story then is repeated over and over and over throughout the scriptures. You know, I've said this before, and I'm, I'm going to say it again. It, you look at Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and you say, well, okay, so we go from, from the garden <clears throat> all the way through to Abraham, verse 8. And, and we, we, that's a lot of time there between creation and and Abraham's time. In fact, that, you know, that takes us past the flood. And we, we are, there's a few names mentioned here. And of course, those names are, are ones that we're familiar with. Uh, Abel, the children, the, one of the sons of Adam and Eve. And then we have Enoch. And then, you know, we, we have Noah. And then, of course, it jumps all the way to Abraham. And it, it's easy to forget that there were millions of people alive throughout that time period. Some of them lived to be, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred. They were old people. They lived a long time. They saw a lot of history. In fact, uh, Jewish um, uh, books, uh, stories, um, I guess you would, I wouldn't call them myths, but they're traditions that have been passed down for thousands of years, tell us that um, Adam, um, in his older age, when, how do you say, well, when did he start becoming old? <laughs> At 100 years old? No, he was still young. At two, 500 years old, he was still young. But towards the end of his life, he became uh, very, very discouraged and, and could not um, bear to witness the, the sin and the, and the degradation that has so quickly come upon the earth. And like God, he was appalled by it. And these were his children. And so he lived in a cave by himself and was, I guess you could say he was depressed. And wouldn't you be? <laughs> you know, we're, he was as human as any of us. But um, we're told that, that Enoch um, would go and, and also um, Seth would go and visit him and talk to him and encourage him. And so it's a, it's a beautiful story. So we're missing a lot of names here. So this is not an exhaustive name of, name of uh, a list of God's faithful, but it gives us a sampling. 
And as we look at these names, let's just take a look at it briefly. We start off with Abel. And it says, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what, we, what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Therefore, we believe that God spoke and the world came into existence. Okay? He's reminding us of, of that. So verse 4, by faith, here it is, verse 4, by faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. And by faith, he was commended as a righteous man. Okay? When God spoke well of his offering. Hmm. So Abel's faithfulness, his obedience to God, made him a righteous man. Now, as I read the, the, the list there, I noted that there are some interesting the statements that are made in the first, uh, five, uh, first seven verses, or eight verses actually. That Abel, he obeyed and offered a sacrifice, and it was acceptable to God, and he was a righteous man. And Enoch, what can we say about Enoch? It's a little about Enoch, and I wish there were chapters written on Enoch. I'd be happy if there was an entire book written by Enoch, but we don't have that. There is a book that's claimed to be written or about Enoch, but I, I'm afraid he didn't make it into the, the canon of the Bible. But here we have the Bible says that by faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. And he couldn't be found because he was taken. He was commended as one who pleased God. So Abel obeyed and offered a sacrifice. Enoch walked with God by faith and God took him. And here's the important part, because we, we must focus in on why was he taken, is because he pleased God. Now, I don't know about you, but isn't that something you'd like to do? <laughs> Please God? Wouldn't you like to be, uh, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be nice for you to have written on your epitaph, heaven forbid, but on your epitaph, he pleased God or she pleased God. Isn't that wonderful? But here it is. Enoch pleased God, and without faith, now, this is an interesting little addition. You know, you didn't, didn't have to say this, but it's added to it. He pleased God, and then it says in verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. I think that's a little message to be passed to us. 7,000 plus years Later, we are sitting here in this beautiful valley, and we are being, we are, we are being told, or, or this is being shared with us, that without faith, we, we can't please God. So it's necessary to have faith. Now, we're going to find as we go through in the next uh, few months, a few weeks, the fact is that there are, like I said, throughout the scriptures, men and women of faith. And they're commended for their faith. But it's interesting because even Jesus recognized the difference between great faith and no faith. Great faith and little faith. Weak faith. Strong faith. So faith is something that you and I bring, okay, along with our sin, we bring Faith to the relationship we have with God. God pours out his grace, which includes, as our lesson study this morning, grace includes a lot. It's a big package. It's a big present that God says, here, here's my grace. It, it includes everything from salvation, eternal life. It includes um, God's mercy. It includes God's forgiveness. It includes Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the major portion of the, of the package. In essence, it is the package, but through Christ, all these things are offered to us. Blessings, mercy, forgiveness, salvation. I was reminded this morning, and I'm not sure, I've got to figure out where, this, where I got this from. I know it's from a book I've read probably recently. But the only thing that we bring to our salvation is our sin. Think about it. That's the only thing we bring. While we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, so we bring our sin, we ask, we repent, ask for forgiveness, you see. That's part of the process. And then our faith 
is that response to God's grace. I guess I can use an example. When, <clears throat> when I was younger, um, much stronger, <laughs> much younger and much stronger, I was in a gymnastics team that traveled all over the West Coast and Hawaii and different places from PUC. And because of my height and, and probably because of my uh, Dutch-German uh, stocky, I call it stocky, this isn't stocky, but the width of the shoulders, I was always put at the bottom <laughs> of everything. I was the, what they called the base man. So if we had a pyramid, I was the base with a couple other guys. If it was uh, three high, I was the base. And so um, I had to, to carry a tremendous amount of weight on my shoulders, which now I'm realizing was a stupid thing, but I enjoyed being in the gym team. It was worth it. But one of the things that, that you learned in the process of being in a gymnastics team is to trust the other person. You build a bond between the other gymnasts, especially if you're the base, and then they're gonna climb on your shoulders, and then a third person's gonna climb on top of them. You are the base, and they have to trust you. And so you build up trust. If, you, if somebody falls and you are the base man, you get the blame, okay? So you, you, you worry a lot about making sure those people get on top of your shoulders properly. I can tell the story, I don't know if I should use her name, but anyway, somebody you probably might have known was uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, women in the team. And uh, she, at that time, was, um, I think, all of about 100 pounds, so she got to be the top person. And we were doing a three high. And this particular day, I was, no, I was not in the pyramid or in the three high. You put three people, one on top of the other, so there's three people. And um, we were on a, they were on a 15-foot uh, tower, and then you add that height, the three high. She was at the top, and uh, we were doing this in a gymnastics uh, or in a in a gymnasium in Northern California for a local high school, putting on this program, doing flips and doing all kinds of you know routines, and and uh, so I got de designated as the spotter. Now, the spotter is the person that stands at the bottom of the tower. And if anybody falls, you catch them. <clears throat> I had never had to catch anybody from that height, but I imagined in my head that it was probably going to be, it was going to hurt. <clears throat> but anyway, my, idea, my job was to make sure that person that's coming down or falling doesn't hit the floor, you know, doesn't hurt themselves terribly. Well, unfortunately, we had not measured and, uh, the height of the ceiling. And so when the third person, <clears throat> Miss Yvonne, was climbing, you know, we, we were, I was, I was down below waiting, watching them climb. The third person went to the top. When she went to stand up, she bumped her head on the ceiling. That's how high they were up. And it distracted her and down she came. Actually, the whole, the whole three high came down, but the two men landed on the platform. She came down, hit her heel on the way down, flipped her, and I put out my arms and I just caught her like this. Well, 100 pound anything coming from that height just nailed me to the floor. But I broke her fall. I was sore, she was sore, but we were both alive. But it's that trust, the, to build trust. She knew that I would be there. You trust your partners. When it comes to a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have to trust him. We sing, trust and obey for there's no other way. Trust, faith, I believe they're twin brothers. And so when we trust, it's by faith then that we have this relationship. When you do, when you do gymnastics routines, when you're helping somebody get onto your shoulders, you get, a, you get a strong grip on them like this. It's like a locking grip and you hold on tight. <laughs> and that usually cannot break. Now, if one person lets go, or get scared or can't trust, then what happens? Boom, and you fall. So you have that trusting relationship. The same thing is true with our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. He reaches down to us. He offers us forgiveness, eternal life. He offers us healings and blessings. He reaches down to us. And by faith, we must reach out and grasp a hold of, of him and hold on tight. And, and those of us that are living today, we know that <coughs> that's, a, that's, a, well, <laughs> that's an understatement. We need to hold on tight. Things aren't getting easier. Things are getting harder. 
You know, Jesus did not promise his disciples or his followers that life would be a bed of roses. In fact, he said, if you follow me, even your families will reject you. All, all, all your friends will leave you, but I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So that's a beautiful promise. And it's by faith. So we have here in Hebrews chapter 11, the beginning of a list of men and women who by faith hold on and build a relationship with, with God. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. So faith is our, our aspect. It's our part in the relationship. You can't have a one-way relationship. It has to be a two-way. If you want a healthy relationship in a marriage or a friendship, there has to be two ways. God's giving, our receiving, and holding on. And so that's what we have here is stories or names of individuals. Now we go to the, the other um, last part of verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. That he, that concept of God existing has been undermined from the very beginning. The, the very first, well, it wasn't the first speech, but at least the first speech Satan made to humans was, don't believe in God, he's a liar. I'll tell you what the truth is, you see. So we must believe God. We must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly, emphasis on earnestly, seek him. So verse 7, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. Okay, so we have Abel obeyed and offered a sacrifice and was considered righteous. Enoch walked with God and God took him home. Noah built, by faith, built an ark and saved his family. All right. And in his faith, he saved his entire family. And by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes, how? By faith. So faith is, is vital. It's so important. It's not just a word. It's not just something to, to theologize about. It is active. It is a, an action of holding on to God and not letting go. It's like that poster I had in my room in college. Um, it was a, a rope hanging. It was a big poster. It was a rope, and then there was a couple little threads, and there was a cat with one, one claw hooked onto that, <laughs> hanging on. It's not going to let go. Sometimes that's how it feels, doesn't it? In life, we feel like we're hanging on with just our fingertips. We're just barely holding on. But you see, God doesn't say, oh, well, your faith isn't any good, so off with you, you know, see you later. God knows that some of us at times in life have weak faith, but he still rewards that faith. He still holds on. He doesn't let go. Some have great faith. Jesus said of the centurion, no greater faith have I found in all of Israel, excuse me, he wasn't even a Jew, but he had faith in God. He had faith that Jesus could perform a miracle, and he knew, and that faith was great, and Jesus called it great faith. And yet he turned to some of those that were walking with him and following him and said, you of little faith, where's your faith? Peter, where's your faith? John, where's your faith? You see, and so just because we're Christian doesn't mean that we have strong faith. Faith is a process of growing, daily growing stronger and stronger. And when God, God holds on to us, sometimes we want to let go, and yet he still holds on to us. While we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. He holds on. He will not let go. So by faith, we are saved. Faith takes what we hope for. Okay, Paul talks about the things we hope for. And he turns it into present realities. This is the beautiful thing about faith, active faith, living faith, is that God takes those things that we see coming or might come in the future, such as the second coming of Jesus Christ, and he turns that into a present reality. We say, oh yeah, Jesus is coming and then everything's going to change and everything's going to be wonderful. And we're going to be taken out of this terrible old world. But remember, Jesus said, what, the kingdom of heaven is... It's present now. It's in you. 
so we can live, we can by faith experience the spiritual kingdom. And eventually, by God's mercy and his grace, we will be in the physical kingdom. And that's something we all hope for. So faith takes what we hope for and turns it into a present reality. Not only a present reality, it turns it into a certainty. You see, a certainty. We sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Are you sure? Is Jesus really yours? Or is it just something you sing about? You see, so faith brings to life this is how I like to see it. Faith brings to life. It animates, I guess we could use the word. But it brings to life what is and what is to come. So we have the kingdom now. This is the kingdom right here and, on, and online. Okay? This is God's kingdom. We can experience the joys and the blessings of God's kingdom now. You see, that's why it's so, so often when you hear Christians mumbling and complaining and, and dragging their tail around, and, and saying, oh, you know, this is such a miserable, such a miserable life. You know, the, the cup is only half full. <laughs> then they are not experiencing what God wants them to experience. They need to see. They need to have their eyes open so that they can see. Open mine eyes that I might see glimpses of what? Truth thou hast for me. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So part of living the Christian life is to begin to see with spiritual eyes the kingdom of heaven present right now. This is the kingdom. These are God's people. You are the children of God. And God has promised to bless you. So faith is what awakens that hope. It's faith is what keeps that hope alive. It animates our life. And we can experience the kingdom of heaven here. A couple of months ago, I guess it's been almost a year, my, um, my younger son, who's a fireman in Loma Linda, um, and his wife decided that um, they wanted to move uh, to a state where they could, um, they could live a life that was a little less stressful and, and maybe um, live in places where they could hike and swim in lakes and things like that. And so they decided to move to Idaho. And um, they prayed about it for a long time, and um, they felt that God was leading in that direction. So they went up there, and <clears throat> he had several interviews in Spokane. Um, and um, he had an interview, I think it was in um, Coeur d'Alene. And um, the, the fire station in Spokane had said, yeah, we'd kind of like to have you, but we've got to go through all the red tape and the you know, whatnots that they have to go through to hire and so uh, he waited and he waited and he waited and nothing came and nothing came. And they made, you know, statements that, well, we're, we're having a fire season and the captain, you know, different things. And so then he thought, well, you know what, I'm going to go, I'm going to go up to, to Coeur d'Alene and there's a couple more stations I can interview at. So he went and, and he went to one station, had an interview. The last station he went to, um, he walked into the door and they said, um, are you by any chance the kid that, uh, that Spokane has on the top of the list? <laughs> he said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> he said, well, um, you're hired. I'm putting it in my own words. Right then and there, you're hired. You know, normally they don't do that. You're hired if you promise to stay in Coeur d'Alene. He said, well, why wouldn't I? I'm building a home about five minutes from here, <laughs> right there in Coeur d'Alene. So you see, they stepped out in faith. They decided that's where they want, they, that God wanted them to live. They bought property, started a home being built, not knowing whether they, he would even get a job. And he got a job. And we praise God. So faith is active also. It's not just standing there and saying, oh, I wish I could live there, or I wish I could go there. Or it's saying, okay, God has me by the arm, or by the hand, and he's leading me. So faith is that assurance, that confidence that God is leading. So if we look at our own lives, we can find examples. I think most people can find examples where, without a question of a doubt, God was leading in your life. You can look back in your life and say, um, this and this happened, and I didn't know what to do. I was bumping up against walls, so I, I began to pray and ask God to show me what to do, and doors began to open. Now, I don't know about you, I, I've always been amazed that when I ask God to, to guide and to lead and I put my life in his hands, 
Um, and when he finally does, um, you know, come through, he doesn't always say, well, this is the one door and you go through that door. Sometimes he'll give you multiple opportunities. He'll say, well, there's this and this and this. And I always say to God, but <laughs> please make it easy for me. Just, just open, you know, just one door. Don't give me three or four choices. And I always hear, well, you guess what? I created you with a brain and the ability to think and to make choices. I will bless you in any of those job opportunities. Just move forward. So sometimes he does. Sometimes he only opens one door. Sometimes he'll open multiple doors. And that gets confusing. But that's because God wants us to use the mind that we have. He wants us to use the gifts, the talents, the blessings that he has given to us. So <clears throat> it's by faith that we claim what God has promised. And he's promised that we are his children. He's promised that he's giving us eternal life. He has promised that there is a way and he will lead us in that direction. So now um, there's, no, uh, there's no point. And if you, if you look at this passage of scripture again, you will see um, that the first couple verses that were read, now faith is being sure. I like the word sure. You can use, you could say being positive without a question of a doubt, being sure of what we hope for. So the question is this morning, well, what do you hope for? Do you have, do you have anything in your mind? Some, somebody you know, might say, well, I, I'm hoping that, that um, you know, I will um, get a new, uh, a new watch for Christmas, or I'm hoping that um, I will have enough money to buy a new car, or I'm hoping, you know, see, we have a list. We have a, like a Santa Claus list. But the thing, is, the thing here is, is that in this passage of Scripture, Paul is saying, now faith is being sure of what we hope for. And being sure of what we hope for means that in the process of being sure, we're connecting, we're connecting with God in, by faith. We're connecting with him, with his grace, with his blessings. And we become sure only because we're connected and the Holy Spirit is leading in our lives and directing us. And then he goes on that we can certain, we can be certain of what we do not see. Well, one of the beautiful things here is that those who are being spoken of, Abel, um, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, they all hoped for the kingdom. We're still there. We are all in hope, we are certain in our hope that Christ is coming back. Now, sometimes people say, well, hope kind of sounds like, eh, we're not quite sure. But a hope is much more. Hope comes out of the depths. You know, we sing the song, we have this hope that burns. You see, it burns in our souls. It burns hope in the coming of the Lord. And that hope comes because we have a faith relationship that every day of our lives, as we walk with God, we see evidence we see evidence of his leading in our lives. Have you seen evidence in the last week of God's leading in your life? Well, I see evidence that God is blessing this congregation. You just look over there through the window and you'll see evidence. You see, it's by faith that this congregation stepped out and said, we're, we're going to finish. We're going to, we're going to fix the sanctuary. It was messed up by water. It was, things were ruined. But by faith, we're going to step out. And as you've stepped out in faith, you, you've been blessed. And not only have you been blessed by, by, you know, by God in so many different ways, but you have people in your congregation, men and women, who have blessed you through their gifts and their talents. And so the, so the job is done in a quarter of the time that it would have been if we'd hired you know, out some business to come in and, and do it. It's done better, and it's done sooner. And we can praise God for that. Next week, we're going to do that. <laughs> we're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to come and worship God and praise him for his blessing and for the way he has led this little congregation for so many years. So faith unites us with Christ and locks us, and locks us into a relationship with him. It locks us. He holds on tight and we hold on tight. 
when our grip starts loosening, he holds on tighter and back and forth. You see, faith, faith is not a constant. It's not constantly strong. It, it wavers a little. Okay, it's just like if you've been over to uh, Magic Mountain. I guess it's called Six Flags now or something like that. I've been there, well, recently I haven't been there, but I've been there so many times. It's like I can see it in my head. But they have so many roller coaster rides there. And the, 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 the secret to making it through the roller coaster ride is to buckle up, <laughs> hang on tight, and you're going to go up and you're going to go down and up and down, but you're going to make it through to the end. You see, the same thing is true in our lives. Our lives are not going to be constantly a high. There are going to be times when we're low. We're going to be in the valleys. Then God takes us to the mountaintops, but then we're back in the valley again. You see, that's all part of living in an imperfect world. So it's faith then. It's by faith that we make it to the end. So <clears throat> by faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. And the beginning in chapter 8 says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed, there's a key word, and I like the next one, and went. <laughs> you can stand and say, well, God, I'm going to obey you. I'm praying, I'm going to obey you, don't worry, I'm, I'm going to obey you. But he, he stepped out. He left his family. He left his business. He left that beautiful city of Ur of the Chaldees. And he stepped out in faith into a wilderness experience. And believe me, it was not an easy one. And it was up and it was down. There were times when he wondered if God still loved him, but yet God hung on and he continued by faith. Hmm. And we're going to talk about Abraham and we're going to um, share that experience of his life the next time we come back to this topic. Next week, though, is going to be our time to celebrate what God has done and how your faith has been very much a part of what goes on here at Yucca Valley. Your faith connected with God's mercy, God's grace, God's love. Hold on. Hold on. Don't let go. Father, we thank you so much that it is your grace that makes it possible for us to have eternal life. It's through Jesus Christ, your son, who came to this earth while we were still sinners. He died for us, made it possible for us to have forgiveness of sin and possible for us to claim eternal life. Bless us, Father, through this beautiful Sabbath day. May we walk closely with you each and every day of this week. Bring us back next week again to worship you. We pray in your name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing song, number 495, Nearer to the Heart of God.
And now may the God of mercy, God of love, walk with us each and every day throughout the coming week. We pray in your name. Amen.